have been doing this for a while, we know how tough it is to get started. Yeah. Um, and I think getting started is the toughest part for uh, these folks. Um, tell us how you got started in the music business. So I went to school at UC Santa Barbara, uh, started in 1992 there, and in the spring of 93, I, uh, a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to do the programming committee. And I, you know, there was plenty of distractions at Santa Barbara, and I, I looked at going into a fraternity rush, and it wasn't for me. Uh, and a friend said, hey, go do this programming committee, and I'm a big music fan. I go, okay, let's go, I'll go apply for that. So I, I got hired on to book movies uh, on campus was the, the role that I got and applied for, which was something to do. Uh, and immediately I saw the guy who booked concerts, and I was like, that, I'm going there, I'm doing that. So I you know, did movies for the, the following year and st already started working on, on uh, concerts for even a year in front of that. I was like, you know, I was gonna will myself into the concert promoter role whether I got it or not. And uh, so when, it, when I got my turn at the, the concert promoter uh, seat, it was uh, probably around 1994 or 95, somewhere in there, and Pearl Jam was doing the anti-Ticketmaster tour that they were ramping up. They were at odds well. with Ticketmaster for fees, and they, I think they'd started their own company. But I had read about what they were doing, obviously, in the press and, and, and Polestar and the industry trades, which, you know, Polestar was like a honestly like a, a, a huge, hugely important source of information to me at the time, pre, you know, pre-internet coming on and... Um, this is still back in the notebook people. days, right? Uh, look, I would read Polestar cover to cover. On, uh, I'll tell you a funny story when I interviewed at Bill Graham Presents about Polestar, but so I'd read about that and I, and I knew what Golden Voice was doing down in LA, so I called up Paul Tillette and I said, hey, you know, you guys have worked with Pearl Jam and you guys seem to do these shows. You should bring Pearl Jam up here to Harder Stadium and I'll do all the legwork to help you get them on campus because at, at, at that time Pearl Jam was probably, you know, Led Zeppelin status and, uh, you know, it would have been a huge coup to get them mm -hmm. up there and, you know, pretty early on I, I knew it was never going to happen but I kept working it and, you know, like when, as soon as the window was there, I was like, Paul, you got to give me a summer internship. I'm doing all this work. Like, I can do all this work. Like, I, I got to find a summer job and we, we clicked pretty well. So. He said, yeah, you, you know, you come down and work for the summer. And I said, well, that's, that's great. I'm just going to start coming down three days a week in the spring. And I just started cutting class and, uh, and going down to L.A. and working with him and Rick Van Santen. And Moss Jacobs was there at the time. And it was the greatest thing ever because I got to intern at a, a kind of a, a burgeoning company that, you know, I went on to work at Bill Graham Presents, which was deep resources at the time. And, you know, an intern at Bill Graham Presents at the time would have been back in the poster archive cataloging things. Yeah. You know, that summer I got to sit between Paul Tillett and Rick Van Santen and, and like watch him make offers, watch him make deals, Good work with these bands. Tie. And <laughs> there was there was a bit, a bit a bit of that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it, but it was a learning experience that you just you it was invaluable because mm -hmm. it, even interns in our office, they don't, you know, they don't get the access to kind of the top guys in the room. So, you know, through that I got invaluable experience went back from my senior year at Santa Barbara we actually ran the concert program in the black that year um, we bought a ton of shows and we we had a good time doing it and I but I also really stayed connected to Paul Tillette um, who's been one of my my good friends in the business and, and a mentor you know throughout and he's obviously gone on to accomplish one of the let's talk about that whole mentor feats. that whole mentors idea um, how important was it for you including Paul and maybe somewhere else along the line um, to have mentors to help walk you through the business, fast track you, if you will. You know, this is, it's not a business uh, that just traditionally uh, develops young talent, right? It's a, it's a business for guys who see opportunity to go and fight their way into a good job. So I, I really feel very lucky that, you know, early on I connected with Paul, um, you know, and I, I worked hard to make my own opportunities to get in front of these people and make the most of it. but. You know, I connected with Paul, and then when I graduated, at the time, Paul couldn't offer me a full-time job, and a friend of a friend of a friend knew uh, Greg Perloff at Bill Graham Presents. I sent a, a resume through a friend of a friend of a friend to him, and it, 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 there was an opportunity where they were looking to bring in somebody young, but I had, you know, I had built up a, a resume at the time that was pretty good, and I, I remember going in to the interview with Greg 
and Sherry and Lee Smith, and they were asking me questions, and I, I brought my show files from Santa Barbara, and I was feeling really prideful because I knew how to put together professional-looking show files from my time at Golden Voice. And uh, I'd actually cut a better deal on uh, a fish date in Santa Barbara than they had. The Greg Perloff? The Greg Perloff at UC Davis. <laughs> and so <laughs> Sherry told me at one point that's, that it was one of the things that really helped seal the deal. But, at the, you know, Greg and Sherry and Lee were all great mentors, and they all had distinctly different styles of how they approached concert promoting and artist relationships and manager relationships. So I, you know, here I, I got dropped into the booking department as assistant of the, you know, the much, you know, historic Bill Graham Presents concert company um, at a time where these guys were all open to imparting wisdom, you know, mm -hmm. so I was smart enough to stay right on their, right on their hip and, and, and look and watch and study what they were doing. Um, but they were also really great to me over the years and sharing that. And as I started to kind of make a few, um, you know, moves in the business and get myself noticed as I moved on, there was guys like Brian Murphy at Avalon Attractions who, you know, during somewhere in the, the SFX Clear Channel roll-ups, you know, he reached out and tried to hire me a couple of times, but even when I told him no, he stayed friend. And like, and I called him and, you know, Brian introduced me to the Bruce Springsteen camp and like, you know, I, been promoting Bruce Springsteen for 12 years now in the Bay Area, and you know Brian opened that door. So mm. those are the guys who have really been, um, you know, good in sharing that wisdom to me. So I've, you know, it's it's harder to do as the business moves at a, as a much different clip these days. But I've always tried to return the favor to people yeah. who work for me. There, there, it's funny when I started in the business, there was. The, there were music universities, but they they primarily taught music, how to play an instrument, yeah. how to compose, how to uh, how to do the skill set. Um, now, lots of top universities are quote unquote teaching the music business. Um, I find and I find that fascinating, like what they what the curriculum must look like. Yeah, well, the, the, I, the, I do too. And but the, uh, my question is, is that you know, and I think you've already touched on it. Um, most of the folks that have succeeded in the music business mm -hmm. have learn by doing that's been your experience yeah so you know for me it started with I, I stumbled into the programming committee but I called Paul Tillett and said do Pearl Jam here right and Pearl Jam was I guess at that time being early and disruptive uh, you know the, you always hear the disruptive technologies these days but you know Pearl Jam was a real disruptive band at that time and it that created an opportunity and I went for it and you know, I started as an assistant at Bill Graham Presents, and you know, the summer before when I had been interning at Golden Voice was the launch of the, the Vans Warped Tour, which in its first year, um, you know, wasn't very successful. But I loved bands like, you know, No Effects and No Doubt and Sublime that were, mm -hmm. you know, not as established as they were, and I, I loved the concept of what they did on that. It kind of came in that Golden Voice wheelhouse of punk rock bands. Um, so when I got to BGP, I kind of like, you know, Lee Smith was doing the Warp Tour in year two and it had already been booked by the time I got there. But, you know, I, I literally just started calling Kevin Lyman with wacky ideas. And the following year, I talked him into going up to uh, Lake Tahoe and we did the Warp Tour on the side of a mountain. But it wasn't, you know, nobody said, hey, do you want to book the Warp Tour? And, it, you know, at that time it was like, you know, I begged Lee and said, hey, can do you mind, you know, like, can I have the shot to work on this? Because I don't know that anybody was that passionate about it. I mm -hmm. was. Um, and so Lee opened the door and said, yeah, you can work on it. He made one intro call to Daryl Eaton and Rick Roskin, and it really, you know, they started it together and it became more Daryl's project. But, um, you know, I've done the Warp Tour ever since and been involved with it. But, you know, I kept bringing Kevin different places mm -hmm. to do the show and different ideas. And, you know, we, we took it to Pier 3032 in San Francisco, which is mm. one of his favorite sites. You can't mm. get on there anymore. The pier's condemned. Thank God it <laughs> never fell in while we're uh, yeah, like that doing was, a show. That would have been, um, been a great news item. So, you know, and then doing the Warp Tour really was, so many bands came through that. It gave me an opportunity to start talking to other people um, and about what their bands were doing. And more of a, a as it got bigger, it helped me raise my profile. So Kevin Lyman was, you know, you kind of talk about those mentors or people who really, um, helped you along the way. Kevin was a big 
part of that because mm -hmm. he kind of gave me the shot and backed me and it you know gave me more credibility to try and buy those bigger shows because it's to a great degree it's as shows get bigger it's still an old guard business you know a lot of mm -hmm. the same guys have been doing it for mm -hmm. a long time so for me to kind of get in there um, that was a big stepping stone in, in a way that I just kind of grabbed it. It's interesting that, you know, even when you were back in college, you, you demonstrated in my eyes one of the, the most important skills of moving ahead in the music business, and that's this idea of networking yeah. and, and asking questions. That old that lady I used to caddy for at this country club when I was just a kid had a great bit of advice. You don't ask, you don't get, which is at the core of networking. Talk about how important networking is uh, in terms of building a career in the music business. Uh, you know, uh, it's funny. I don't think of it as, as networking. Networking to me is like We're here you're, at the dropping business, you're dropping business cards and like, hey, how are you? And do like, so I've, I've you know, for me, I've, uh, my building of relationships has kind of stemmed from I'm passionate about a band I want to work with mm -hmm. or a project I want to take on. And, you know, when I was a junior guy at, at, uh, at Bill Graham Presents or SFX, whatever we were at that time, and Incubus, you know, first record popped, and you know Michael Bailey, who books the Fillmore, I think was kind of your your main point of contact. And you know, I, just being aggressive, I said, "Well, wow, you know, let, I'll, let's do more with this band." I didn't know Steve Rennie. Mm -hmm. I knew John Harrington, who said, "Call Steve Rennie up." And mm -hmm. so I called you up. I said, "Steve, I think we've met a, a pole star somewhere. I don't know if we even had, but like, I love the band. This is what I'm doing now." Here's my ideas, and I, you know, I don't, you know, you you talk a lot, and I, I don't think I let you get a word in edgewise on the first conversation about what we should be doing with Incubus in Northern California, mm -hmm. and that's how you, you know, the pitch was good. Mm -hmm. I, you said there's something here. Okay, let's do this, and mm -hmm. you know, we 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 knocked it out of the park in Sacramento that first year when no one recall. expected Arco Arena to sell out, and it was, you know, it was a home run, and that's where. I base that relationship. So to me, that's what networking is. You know, just kind of socializing is um, that that part of it. Like, I, I'm not the guy who loves to yeah. like, you know, hang out and chatter. Yeah, I think it's, I, it's hard. It's hard enough to kind of come and do one of these events uh -huh. for me, like because it's it's out of my wheelhouse. Well, yeah, I suppose so. But it, but you know, I'll say from my perspective, I, I recall those first phone calls we had, and in what what. I responded to was I, I always have loved people that will call out of the blue and right. say, hey, I got an idea for you. And uh, whether you call that networking or not, that's that idea of asking, saying, I got an idea and I'm going to ask uh, the question rather than ask the question and answer it in your own mind and then the, the question never comes up. And uh, that was a great night in Sacto, by the way. It was. It was and, and along the way, we've had a couple other nights uh, that weren't quite as good. Let me ask you this. Um, you talked about a couple guys here in particular that uh, that we've had a chance to talk to, you know, through the course of our Ren Man Music and Business and our web show, Kevin Lyman, and we're going to talk to Paul Tollette here on Friday. Um, both of those guys worked through some difficult stages in the development of both uh, the Warp Tour and um, Coachella, places where wiser, saner, more rational people might have folded up their tent and gone home, right? Um, you know, that, that attitude of working through obstacles or working through people telling you you can't make something happen, I've characterized it as this kind of fuck the gatekeeper mentality. Yeah. Are there, are, there, are there specific moments that you can remember somewhere in your career where you were pushing the rock uphill, where you were, you know, you were trying to get something to happen that nobody believed in and that you had a, your own fuck the gatekeeper moment. Yeah, you know, I, I think, look, I mean, Paul, Paul and Kevin, I think, are in the Hall of Fame for those kind of moments. Mm -hmm. They really are, uh, you know, radical, I guess, is the word that comes to mind. But they, you know, they, they literally put it all on the line personally, professionally, emotionally, financially, kind of financially um, to really see those things come to fruition and flourish and so that's amazing i've i've always worked within a company um you know and and you don't get to keep working in a company if you don't deliver it's that's that's the business part of it but the you know where i've been where i've gotten a, a paycheck those guys really put their balls on the line to you know see it through and and 
would not take no for an answer. But you know, through the years, it was it, at times there was politics in the SFX Clear Channel roll-up of we're going to do things a certain way and we want you to do X. When you when we didn't see it that way, you had to really kind of fight against it. And then to be at a time where I came into the amphitheater business, maybe when the amphitheater business was in a bit of a downturn mm -hmm. in terms of you know some a lot of the older demo acts were going into arenas and the higher gross, bigger ticket prices were coming on. So I had to be much more disruptive, I guess, in like, well, I don't, you know, it's easy top, I don't care that you don't want to play the amphitheater anymore. Like I've got this radio show concept and we're gonna charge you know, 10 bucks to kind of get you in and I'll, you know, if I can make more money at, um, at the food and beverage stands by having a lot more people than when, what was coming out for, for any, you know, ZZ Top or any band of that, that time and be creative. Um, those were things that when I talk about them at big company meetings, I don't know that I got a lot of support. I got a few crazy stares mm -hmm. at it. Um, but we kept just trying to like, you know, figure out how to, make great, you know, creating content in this business is hard, you know, at the end of the day, you can go chase bands, but that's, you know, that's only going to get you mm -hmm. so far in terms of, you know, I've got a checkbook, you've got a checkbook, you've got an idea for a band, and that, that's part of the sales job, but when you're trying to actually create a platform in which they can play on, you know, Paul's created kind of the biggest global one in Coachella, which is fantastic, but, you know, as a, as a Live Nation, a friend of mine, Jeff Wills and I, who does uh, comedy for Live Nation, and he, he and I created this, uh, this comedy festival where we took, at the time, it was George Lopez and uh, Carlos Mencia, I think it, I'm not, I can't remember for sure, but I think it was Paul Rodriguez was the third comic, and we put him, uh, you know, it was a Latin-geared comedy show, and we did something like 11,000 people the first time out at Shoreline. You know, comedy yeah. shows didn't do 11,000 people, certainly yeah. not in an amphitheater. And, you know, it, it was good because San Francisco, whether we were SFX or Clear Channel, like kind of that, that BGP mentality, which is, you know, pretty infamous at times with some managers and stubborn, but like it also allowed you to kind of to go for it too. It wasn't a conservative place. So if you had a good idea, um, you were always kind of encouraged to go for it. Yeah. And, you know, we swung and missed a few times, too. <laughs> well, I think part of, uh, you know, you, you, to Paul and Kevin, and part of doing something great is, is understanding and accepting the fact that you could be dead wrong and accepting responsibility for that. Um, and uh, that's why the promoters, to me, are always the greatest examples of the fuck the gatekeeper. They get an idea, they put tickets on sale, and six or eight weeks later... It's pretty quick validation, you know? Like, I talk to some of these people that develop tech companies or you know, real estate development, you know, two or three or four years before you know if you were right. I had, man, who's got the patience for that? You know, yeah. like, <laughs> like I kind of I kind of like the six to eight week project. You settle the show and go, Ooh, you know, I, I made or lost this. Yeah. And there's something there's something very definitive about it mm -hmm. that I love. You know, um, there's there's no opinions when you go down to the end of the sheet. You either sold enough tickets to, to make some money I mean, for the band and hopefully for yourself or you didn't, and not a lot of editorial to give on the Monday morning meeting. Uh, but I'll bet you had a few Monday yeah, morning well, meetings it, it, afterwards where they go, Rick, whose fucking idea was this? Yeah, well, that's where you get good at spin, you know? <laughs> Whether you spin it to your boss or spin it to a manager while you talk them into something. Uh, yeah. You, uh, you, gotta, you gotta have a story. So you defied all the odds. You, you started as a college kid that loved music. Now you're making, how long have you been in the business now? Uh, I start. I guess I started professionally in 1996 and did it in college for a few years before that. So you're almost 20 years in. 20 years in. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I don't know if you qualify as a as a and grizzly old, <laughs> old veteran. <laughs> grizzled but a grizzly veteran for sure. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this: If you were gonna give some advice to people that are just starting off or are contemplating a career in music biz in the music business, what would you tell them? Um, a. a you either have the bug or you don't. In a way, you only, I only, it seemed maybe strange kind of looking at it from the outside, but I was just so consumed with understanding how this stuff worked that it was, you know, I was all in on it. And as I, as I kind of got started as an assistant, it was, you know, back then you had to process a lot of contracts and 
Monterey Peninsula Artists would issue three copies of contracts. William Morris was five, I think CAA was four, ICM was four, and you handwrite all these contracts and the changes and the legal stamps and this, that, and the other, which all of which now are done digitally with one guy, and it, it's, it's very quick. You actually sign those contracts? I don't think I ever signed one of my whole contracts. I, I, I've signed hundreds of contracts. I've gotten like two in 20 years <laughs> back from an artist, but um, the I'd, I'd get in it like, six or seven in the morning if I had to, to get the contracts out of the way so I could sit on the phone and eavesdrop on Lee's calls all day. So that's like, I had to know what he was doing mm -hmm. because that was more interesting to me and you had to have that bug. So I'd say anybody who's starting out is be passionate. The same way you said, I, I don't mind when somebody calls me cold. Like I might not always take the call, mm -hmm. but you catch me. I've hired a few people that way over the years. Um, and look for opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of good assistants um, over the years who, you know, they want to be a talent buyer in LA. And I, I start every assistant out that wants to be a, a promoter and say, well, you know, great, uh, go home tonight and get out a map of the United States. And I want you to circle three cities you wouldn't move to for whatever reason. Like, I just, like, I, I don't like mm -hmm. Poughkeepsie. I'm never going mm -hmm. there. But if the right job booking a club or something opens up tomorrow or a good room, a good booking job opens up, leave in 48 hours. And like, you've got to, you've got to want it because maybe to be the great LA buyer, you got to you know, cut your teeth somewhere else for a little bit. I was really fortunate that I came into an established company at a time where they were giving opportunities. When you were starting it out at Avalon, it wasn't, it was far more cutthroat back in those days as far as barrier to entry. Oh yeah. And uh, so, you know, I try and encourage people like recognize where a good opportunity is because mm -hmm. you can have a lot of fun in any town and hopefully yeah. that leads you back to, to where you want to be. But, you know, I see a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of people are inspired what Paul does mm -hmm. at Coachella and there's a lot of young festivals out there that kind of, you know, look to him and he's really good at like talking to people who are, have emerging festivals mm -hmm. and, and you know, I, I, I don't know, you could ask him if he describes it as mentoring or not, but he just likes to hang and talk mm -hmm. music and, yeah. and what they're doing. I, he, he doesn't view it as like your competition. He, I think he's pretty mm -hmm. comfortable with Coachella's place in the world. Yeah. Um, but it's really impressive to watch Paul kind of really engage a lot of young festival producers. I think it's fun for me to watch because, you know, you mentioned Brian Murphy and uh, who was one of my mentors and Bob Geddes. You mentioned that your mentors all, you know, Sherry, Lee and, and Greg all had a very distinctly different style about them. And those, mm -hmm. are, those are great things. And so it's fun for me to, to see Paul, who's now certainly a grizzly veteran in the business yeah. now, um, sharing because the truth of the matter is the people that you grew up with, the business, people I grew up with in the business and even myself right now, and with conscious or otherwise, I've always had a willingness to share. And I think it has said something about, I don't know, the spirit or the, the, the fraternity or sorority of the music business type. Yeah. I, look, it's, you find people that you connect with. And like, even when I, you know, Paul, Paul wasn't in a position to hire me in 96. And I was lucky mm -hmm. enough to get into BGP, but he supported me up there. Mm -hmm. And for a guy who used to, you know, run to El Pollo Loco and get his, you know, his chicken, corn, and black beans lunch all summer long. Um, he was always, even at times we competed for the same thing, he was always really supportive of, uh, of what I was doing up there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, Paul had made some overtures to hire me at a time when I wasn't going to leave San Francisco, which was always appreciated. But, uh, you know, the thing is that, that you talk about the fraternity of it and really what resonated me with, with Paul was like when I, uh, when Live Nation moved me from San Francisco down to, LA in 2008, he was the first person to call me and said, this is going to be awesome. And like, he's at our main competition and he's like, he was just, it was more, I'm happy for you. This is going to be fun. You're going to do great. Yeah. And you know, to me, it was pretty wild because I came down at the time when Live Nation was renovating the Hollywood Palladium mm -hmm. and I, you know, inherited that project and had to get the room open. And I'm like, I'm booking a room we're overseeing a room that's getting booked, you know, like Greg Siegel, great promoter, um, that, you know, Golden Voice kind of, it was one of their main vehicles to build their, their business, their notoriety off of. Yeah. Um, and so it, it wasn't lost on me. It was funny to the point where, like, I do really respect and try and understand the history of concert promoting mm -hmm. and who the players were, that I remember the second night we were open, Gary Tovar showed up at the Palladium and, you know, Gary's been at it a long time and, and really enthusiastic guy, but you know, he's, 
he was hanging out around the front door. He wasn't on anybody's list or something. And I, I saw him out of the corner of my eye, and I think our GM said, who is, who is that? And I go, you know, you know, Julie, this is, this is Gary Tovar. He's one of the reasons we're all sitting here today. He goes into the Palladium anytime mm, yeah. he wants. Like, this is, you know, you got you to gotta respect where that came from. I, yeah, and I can remember speaking of the Palladium, a great storied venue. I can remember when, uh, back in the day, when I was a young buck in the business, probably, you know, a little bit younger than you at this point, uh, Avalon had secured the exclusive on the Palladium. And, and Golden Voice was kind of shut up. And I can remember through Jim Guerno, another friend of ours, who yeah. was, was also part of Gary's little intern posse, had kind of thrown out an olive branch. And so we, we said, hey, you guys can come in and rent the Hollywood Play. And I'll, remember, I'll never forget the first show that we, quote, co-promoted with Golden Voice at the Hollywood Palladium was Black Flag. And it was a freaking melee outside, yeah. ending with, you know, some kid got up on the roof of the Palladium and picked up one of those hard plastic things that they put glasses in because there was the production offices on the other side of that production offices was the kitchen and the dishwashing thing. Some kid heaved that thing down on the security guard's head at the back door, and the guy came walking into the production office bleeding, going, who fucking booked this show? And that's when I walked out <laughs> the go. door <laughs> and blamed it probably on Paul Tillett and Gary Tovar, you know? So a small world, you know? Um, you know, it's been fun. All right, well, you know, I want to say thank you for uh, taking some time and sharing with us a bit here today. Absolutely. You did great. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Mueller, thank you very much. Thanks for and, having me. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on again. We'd love to do it.